I, I'd start, if I would, if I may, just by kind of uh, giving you know, some of you hiding down the back corner there. So, apologies, I might want. Can you hear me without? The, you don't need the, the mic, right? So I can wander around. So I prefer. Um, so we're in a slightly controversial talk. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about. I, I'm the innovation director at LV, so my job is to kind of find different ways of doing things in a corporate environment in insurance, right? So you couldn't really pick, you know, worse. Um, a, a place to try and do something very different. Um, I, kind of just, I just wonder, like, how, how many of you, or we're talking about the culture, generating a culture of innovation. And on my point is, generally, it's about the fact that we've got to think much wider than just having some people doing something funky in the corner. Uh, and I talk about some ways that we've done that a little bit, but I, I really kind of like some you know, participation in your thoughts. So how many of you kind of think that innovation is a challenge, like to be different and change is a challenge in your organisations? I'm not quite sure what sort of organisations you, you come from. Do you, do you largely kind of big-ish corporate type things or...? Um, okay. Um, so, so we're kind of sharing, sharing a problem. Um, and my premise, I'm actually going to quite the slide set we've got here, but, because I've got a couple of versions of this. But my premise is actually that organisations, it's pretty big, but it's <laughs> sitting quite close to it, so sorry about that. Um, organisations actually reject innovation because when you do something by definition that's innovative and different, it actually feels wrong to an organisation that's kind of formed and stable and um, and I, I think, in some ways, innovation is treated a bit like a virus. So when you first do something different, it doesn't actually have much effect, or you know, people accept it because it's there. But the, the idea of especially innovating at scale or trying to make your company change is obviously to, to make that a much bigger thing. And as soon as it gets bigger, I've found in, in um, kind of a long history of trying to do this, and I haven't picked the greatest um, places to try, I think. So the Home Office um, and large insurance companies, and a small spell at Barclays, um, they're, they're all very large and stable organisations. Um, and they start to surround the innovation and kind of make it the same as everything was before. Uh, you know, that, that it doesn't, doesn't feel right. And there's more of them than there are of you if you're on the innovation space and trying to make a change. So, and that's not really a criticism of the organisation. What I'm saying is really that's a natural thing to happen because what we've set organisations up to do is to, is to, you know, they've grown over the years to be stable and do the thing that they're trying to do. So I'm not picking on the us and them, but it's really hard to get change to happen. But change has to happen because whilst I might disagree with this gentleman's um, philosophies on where the world came from, um, it is no doubt clear that you have to adapt and change to survive. Okay? And that's just the same for organisations. We have to adapt and change and be different. So, so how do we do that if our tendency and also desire is towards stability? So one of the things that we found, and I run the innovation um, practice at LV, it's probably, I, I guess you, you kind of mature your thinking, but it's probably the one place where I've really got to grips with kind of how you do it as a, as a sort of change function. And the main thing, I think, is that you've actually got to be doing innovation everywhere. It, it's not about really funky kind of new products, although it can be. It can be everything from what, what we call core innovation, which is innovating on the stuff that you do do every day. So just not, not new and different, but the way that you operate your company has to change and mature as you go along. So the core innovation is kind of improving um, your, your you know, common practices. And today, and the technology that's available to us, I mean, everybody's talking about kind of robotics and AI um, and you know, automation, especially in call centers um, and, and anywhere where you've got people interacting. It's a massive opportunity to, to radically change the way that you do your kind of day-to-day -day operation. But it's a tough thing to do. But we, we also look at um, adjacent innovation. So by that I mean doing the things that you do, but if you have a product or you have you know, a financial services set like we do, looking at 
the different variants of that product. So, so we're selling things. It's a different. It's, it's a quite a different way of selling it. We, um, in the innovation function, launched uh, an application, um, a, a life insurance or um, sick pay uh, application, which made it much easier for people to buy kind of um, life cover without the tedious and long-winded application process and the, and the detailed medical underwriting because you just figure that people want different stuff and that's really a big pressure at the moment isn't it the people the millennial generation that everybody talks about they don't use word but we desperately need a different way of interacting with uh you know the, the organizations we're all set to expect that through the amazon and the ubers and the kind of the way that we buy stuff is changing but the way we deal with financial institutions um, especially insurance is pretty much the same. It's kind of very uh, slow. So we have to try and launch new products. And then we look at you know disruptive innovation. And actually, when you when you, oh, we talk about like having a culture of innovation, even when you achieve that, if you achieve that, you you're really unlikely to be able to internally generate truly disruptive innovation, I believe, because you, it's that's kind of the fundamental on turning the company over. Very few people have achieved that. I mean, Nokia were a really good example at one time in the past when we were making Wellington boots and realised that's not going to work, so let's do mobile phone. That's very, very rare. So in order to try and challenge the disrupted end of the spectrum, we kind of look outside the organisation. And we work with people like Startup Bootcamp, um, who nurture the, the kind of startup, very early end of the startups. And we do it for two reasons. Not because we necessarily want to buy the product or the service or the, or the new thing they do, but it's looking at the way they work. And if you work with a startup organization and you embed yourself in that mindset, it's, it's frightfully different. Right? They, they, the whole um, way that they think about problems and attack them, and um, you know, driven by the time that they've got, I mean, it's basically driven by how much time we've got before the money runs out, mostly. Right? But um, so so, the, so there's um, a disruptive end where you're kind of looking at where is the market going? And insurance is an interesting. Anybody from insurance background? Yeah. Well, I'm safe to say, I mean, insurance is um, in, is going to be uh, predicted to be very disrupted in the next ten years because of kind of the car safety thing, because of the different habits of people buying houses. Uh, the home insurance is under threat because there's so many more you know, sharing opportunities. Um, there's you know, a, a sharing economy which drives a different behavior. So we're a very established industry, but very ripe for disruption. So we have to be trying to cover the spectrum of these things. Um, and, and the other point is innovation is not particularly radical all the time. Right? It's, never, it's never easy. So as a few of you, right, who's from medical background? Hang on. Okay, so let you off. You know who that is? Anybody? So top top marks for. Uh, I'll get you a coffee afterwards if you know who this. Um, really yeah. It's really Well, good to know. Um, this chap, um, Ignald Samowitz, he he came up with a really cool innovation, which is probably the reason that some of you are here, or some of you wouldn't be here if he hadn't done it. What he actually promoted was the practice of hand washing in maternity. Now at the time, the maternity um, ward death rate was massive, it was horrible. Um, and, and he came up with this really simple idea that he thought that washing of hands in Lyme solution would actually reduce the death rate. But he didn't know at the time about you know, the, the, the reason why all the research, all the discoveries about kind of um, microbiotics and stuff were, were um, to come ahead of him. So he had a hell of a job to persuade people to do something really sensitive. But he had a belief and he, and he did um, push for it and actually had a, a something like 40% improvement in mortality rates when, when he, he did that. But my point is, I mean, he came up with something really simple but it's still really hard to get people to change. He came up into a lot of abuse actually. Because you know people were saying, well, you're criticising me. You're saying, you know, we're dirty or whatever. You know, the, uh, it, it's a kind of interesting history. But but that's what happens in your organisations when you propose something different. 
fundamentally, what you're saying is what you're doing is wrong in some cases. If you're really conscious of how you put the, the way, if your culture of innovation of getting it accepted is really interesting. And one of the things that we um, do, pulling on a, an, another historical figure who kind of came up with the concept of classification uh, a long time ago, um, we start to think about it helps to think about the types of innovation that you're doing and what you're actually aiming for. And we use these three classifications to try and help. So I'll just explain briefly what, what that's all about. So one of done innovations, the type of stuff, a bit like the hand washing, where you kind of say, you know, we're, we're normally talking about technology, but not always, can we just practice changes. But if it's one and done, it's where something in your business has got a problem, and you can just do something different that fixes that, and it's done. Right. There is no long tail investment to it, there's no sort of third or fourth iteration of it, it's just the thing is done and we, we find ways of using kind of modern technology and technology is becoming so much easier actually to deploy challenges. But we, we use the one and done stuff where we can sort of say we can fix that problem, let's just go and do it, do it quickly. Some of them don't work so being able to fail is really important. Um, but knowing that once it's done, it's done, it's really comforting to people. And then we look at the other two categorations, like, which is, so test and invest on the other X3 is where we're trying something out as an innovation function. That, so we fund, I should explain, the innovation within my team. So you don't have to go to the corporate kind of piggy bank to, to get the thing done. You can find a problem, you can work out whether you can do it, uh, and we'll fund it. But we only fund, we, we kind of limit the, what we do by the funds, if, if you like. So you know, it's not a backdoor to major development. But test and invest is where we work with somebody to prove that the concept that they're trying to do will work to get them to that investment point. Because otherwise, you tend to find that there's like massive debates, or we do. I mean, who, who has massive debates about whether you should or shouldn't do something and then spends nearly as much money working out whether you should do it as, the, as you do doing it, if you know what I mean? So it's about accelerating that view, working with third parties often um, on small scale pilots or um, you know, funded, sometimes sometimes not funded, um, but to, to get to the point where we know the investment is worthwhile. And doing that much more quickly and practically is really <coughs> worth doing, but doing it with the consciousness that it's a test and invest activity is important because then you know you've actually got to go for the money afterwards. There's no point in starting if you're not going to get the money. And that was a mistake that we made in some. We kind of went off with the business who had a really great thing they wanted to do, got to the proof point that it would work, and then they went, well, yeah, actually, but there's no way we're going to get the funding. So we look at it ahead of time and then say, well, we won't start if you can't see the routes to, to get the money. And the third one is, um, in the middle of those two, where we can deliver something through the innovation function, which is the first version of an application that is definitely good to go live and works for what they want to do, but is only like, you know, it might be for one department, as an example, and they need to do it for 100 departments or one product line to really improve something. And it's really worth doing because you, you get the, the traction and the proof point and it does make it easier to move on. And then it's a more gradual, longer term investment. When you set up a feature team to go and continue that. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and then the, the, other, the other point about kind of looking at radical innovation, um, we work with the startups. Um, we learn from the startups, it's really interesting. But I think you could rewrite the book actually, which is kind of startups are from Venus and corporates are from Mars. Because, frankly, um, we absolutely murder most startup operations because these guys, when we were at Startup Bootcamp, they had 100 days to get from a concept to a viable product. Right? I can get some great ideas to come to the business and get a response that says, oh, yeah, we can make a meeting in six weeks' time or something. And then that probably gets down to the moon. Um, you know, we want different proof points. We send people as corporate 70 or 80 page contract documents or security documents or the same stuff we would have sent to IBM or you know the big engineering firms who've got the resources to go there. These guys haven't got the resources to plan through that. We we you know and when we do this we but we start to look at have to look at everything. If you want an innovative culture in your company, you've got to think about everything, your security department, your sourcing department, your the way you do this stuff quickly isn't just about building the tech or finding the right answer. It's about 
kind of having, having an ecosystem that actually allows it to work with your organisation. And, and we're pretty bad, I think, as a whole. Um, and, and we can by no means cracked all this. So I'm just reflecting some of the challenges that you, you really have to go to act to, to get to a culture of innovation. And then we, you can build stuff. Technology is really easy, and there's, there's just a million third parties out there. I went to um, DIA in Barcelona, which is a, a whole conference about startups. There are about 60 startups there, and I left it thinking. Frankly, there's anything that you could imagine that any company wanted to do, somebody out there doing it off the bat for you in a brilliant way, and there's great opportunities to change what you do. But when you get to, you know, the, the I've got this idea, and I want to release it, I want the change to happen, it feels like this sometimes. Right? Your corporate, the corporate culture of introducing new things, or the, you know, the finances, or the change process, it's, it's just like this. And you kind of say, you've got So we, spent an awful lot of time in our innovation function trying to break down the barriers that are kind of the entry point. So work with your service introduction people, your kind of, um, you know, your business change people, your, your marketing teams, that, that you, you start working on the way that they do things so that when the innovations come to them, it feels a little bit less like this. Um, you know, sometimes there, there are people further down the road building the wall back up again. Um, which is kind of what, what, why it's a bit of a challenge. And I think another point to make was that just because you create or do something that is fundamentally different and, and has, has a proof point, the culture of innovation is not as easy to generate, as in um, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will believe it off the bat. Right? There are still a large number of people, I believe, in the flat earth society if there's any members here today, or <laughs> don't be afraid to admit it, because I, but frankly, there are still people, you know, who, who have that belief, right? And, and whatever evidence you might provide to the contrary that we need to do something different, there will always be a bunch of people who are kind of going, I don't believe it, I'm going to be fine. Um, so, you know, there's a whole variety of reasons for that. We talked, I was talking to people yesterday actually saying, you know, one of the things you get is, you know, well, Maybe, but I'm retiring in three years and I don't really care. Um, and that inhibits companies. So people talk about, obviously, like buy-in from the top, etc. And it is really important to buy in from the top. But do you have buy-in to the fact that you need to have somebody doing some innovation somewhere? Or do you have buy-in to the fundamental point that you've got to try and change your company and do something different? And you, you'll, you'll get an awful lot of people um, who will group behind the, well, yeah, it's okay that we're trying something, but I, I don't really want to change, um, because they just don't believe. And, and are getting people to believe, are, are not, I don't know whether this sounds too negative from the point of view of, but if it's hard, it just is hard to get innovation and change to happen regularly. Um, and you've got to remember that there's a lot of people just not going to be convinced by what you're saying. And I think one of the reasons for that is probably um, because when we look at our organization structures, we measure people on doing what we did yesterday, maintaining profits that we made yesterday, create, coming up with the KPIs or sticking to the KPIs or kind of building on what we've actually done before. And that's, um, you know, so it's a fair point, right? As an innovator, I go to people and go, oh, we should try this. They're going, I've got to maintain this, I've got to, you know, I'm measured and targeted on doing what we did yesterday. And you're telling me to do something different. Something scary, something that may or may not work. And frankly, if you don't, okay, don't know that it's working, or you don't know if you, if you know that it's, you know, fundamentally not got any risk in it, it can't be very innovative. But but look at how you measure your departmental leaders and managers and people in your organisation. If you want innovation and change to happen, it's got to be in their objectives. It's got to be in their measures. It's got to be kind of part of the. You know their, their targets for the year and sort of that kind of thing, um, and, and you know it's that's not that easy to do because organisational structures, especially if you're in a big or large, long-established organisation, are very heavily embedded. It's the ironwork of the organisation, and frankly, if you if you when you're trying to change that, you you can't expect um, to you, know, you can't expect that to be a, a simple process. 
So again, the whole point is that it's not good enough to just be universally in a corner. You've got to think that actually what you're tackling is a pretty much end-to-end -end, um, challenge. And, and really think about what innovative success and change means for your organisation. And one of the challenges that we find, and a lot of people find, I think, is that people want to measure innovation in the old way. So actually, did it make, you know, I'll be selling 10,000. We've launched some products, and I've referred to one before. Like one, one of our earliest innovations, a brand new product we want to put out, we were trying to find out whether 50 plus, which is funeral insurance in fact, um, is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's what you're saying. So, there's lots of 50 plus insurance is generally the, the fuel savings that, um, that, that people do. And, and they're you know, typically branded, you typically get a free toaster or a pen or whatever, you know. And what we wanted to know, the experiment we did was will that work if we, if we did a bargain basement cheap as chips, really cheap to administer, kind of unbranded version of that, would it, would it sell? Would that work? You know, is that a better way to do it? And it was a test. And when it didn't sell a lot, but it wasn't, people did buy it, but it was um, not necessarily uh, achievable because of the marketing effort you had to put behind it, kind of, you couldn't get it to people's attention, if you know what I mean, without the marketing investment. And that was kind of what we found out, and I'd say that was a real success in terms of, we wanted to know, it had been lurking around as a board question for a long time, and we found out the answer. Right? But, but people went, well, that's not really successful because it didn't sell any, I knew it wouldn't. It was like, yeah, but that's not the point, right? So innovation and change is not about one particular thing, it's a whole mix of things. So think about if you want to have a culturally endemic set of innovation in your company, what the success measurements of that are going to be. What are you actually trying to achieve? Are you, you know, so we, we talk about changing culture, changing um, vocabulary. So in the three or four years that we've been doing the innovation group, the words test and learn and the words innovation of, and um, agile are very much accepted within the corporate mentality. It's not just as what we've been doing, but that's part of the success of an innovation culture. Getting people to accept that, doing things differently, taking some risks, failing occasionally, is kind of okay. Well, she's going to be another five minutes later, so you can tell me this five minutes ago. Um, so I, I guess this is, um, you know, a, a sort of last slide really, but, but if you are in the innovation, if you are in that role that is trying to change stuff for your company, then kind of just, it is tough and a lot of stuff gets rejected. And frankly, if you're not getting stuff rejected, you're not trying hard enough. Right? So everybody wants, especially if you're just starting out on how do I do this, um, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff, there's an awful lot of pushback, and there's, a, there's an awful lot of things to think about that are much wider than the thing that you're trying to build. The tech is really easy nowadays. Um, but, but I would say don't be disheartened by that because it's, it's fundamentally, you've got to continue to keep pushing the barriers in an innovation culture. Because if you do something and it, and it works and you change a way of doing something and you just stick with that, then, then you're back to the status quo. Like you're, not, you're not being innovative. You kind of have to keep in that space where people are pushing back on you. And if you're not doing that, then you're not really um, kind of pushing the boundaries hard enough. So I'll just say finally for all of you who are trying to do something different in your organization, um, it, you know, it's, it's necessary, it's important for survival. You're really key to what your company's future will be. Um, so you just have to keep going and, and good luck with that.